Well, I'd like to tell you about a project that ran at MIT between uh, 2009 and 2013, the production in the Innovation Economy Project. But I'd like you to start by remembering uh, 2009 and the confusion and fear and real terror that uh, prevailed in the country uh, as the financial and economic crisis was rolling along. This was a time when the economy seemed to be falling apart. And it was hard to know which parts should be salvaged and which parts could be salvaged. Uh, should we save the banks? Do we save GM? Uh, what about manufacturing? Uh, three million manufacturing jobs disappeared almost overnight. And many of the mid-sized American companies that had been doing pretty well uh, up until then suddenly found themselves in what they described to us in the group later as near-death experiences. And it was at this point in 2009 that MIT President Susan Hockfield asked Philip Sharp, a uh, Nobel uh, laureate biologist, and me to head up a group of faculty from across the institute to uh, examine whether the United States really needed manufacturing at all. Was there really a case for trying to salvage uh, production in the United States? Now, this was an issue uh, uh, on, on which there was really very divided, uh, there were really very divided views in the country. Our friends, the economists, and here I'm thinking of Larry Summers and Gary Becker, uh, had already argued that uh, it was just natural that manufacturing and production should largely disappear in the United States, that it was just like agriculture. In 1900, we needed about 40% of the workforce in the United States to be working on farms in order to feed all of us. And uh, today, we need fewer than 2% of the population working on farms in order to feed all of us. Uh, and just so with manufacturing, as they said, you know, in the past, we needed to have a large manufacturing workforce. Uh, uh, today, thanks to productivity increases, uh, we really just didn't need to have that many people. So what was happening, uh, even if it happened in the form of a kind of uh, uh, catastrophe uh, of the crisis, was really, after all, something normal and, and natural. And uh, in fact, as we uh, looked around at the situation, uh, many of the people in the group, uh, the research group that I'm about to tell you, themselves were very uncertain and divided about whether what was happening to manufacturing uh, was something that we ought as a public policy to try to do something about or whether it was something that just should be allowed to, allowed to happen. What we could uh, agree on in the research group was, as we looked around at MIT and at other great universities in the country, that the United States was, in fact, really great at innovation. So the question we uh, then asked ourselves was, we're great at innovation here, but do we really need production in the United States in order to get the value from our innovation? After all, the greatest new companies in the United States over the previous 25 years. Think of Apple, Cisco, Qualcomm. These were companies that were doing R&D and design and distribution in the United States, but they weren't doing any production or manufacturing in the United States, and yet we could see that those companies were getting the lion's share of the profits on their, on their products. So, Many people, even in our group, sort of thought, why don't, why, why don't we all do Apple? Why don't we all, as the United States, basically try to move down a path where we do what we're really good at doing, <clears throat> R&D, design, uh, innovation, and then let production be anywhere in the world? Uh, and uh, as we then came to frame the question for this uh, research group that Susan Hockfield had uh, established, um, the question we came to ask was, if we want to get full benefit from American innovation, do we need to have some amount of production and manufacturing in proximity to that innovation in the United States? Uh, and by uh, get full value 
from innovation. What we meant was to see good jobs, good new companies, good growth in the companies we had, and good growth, economic growth, uh, sustainable growth in the United States. Do we need manufacturing in order to get those benefits from our innovation? So the group that came together uh, in the production in the innovation economy project, PI, uh, the project included engineers, scientists, faculty from Sloan School, and economists. And as uh, several people here this morning and Tom Wolf last night emphasized, it, uh, MIT is a really unique place in the ability to pull groups together across disciplinary lines. It was not hard to persuade those colleagues in engineering and the other departments to participate in this, in this project. There's a great tradition at MIT of pulling groups like this together. In fact, one at the end of the 1980s uh, that Michael Dertuzos, who was then head of the uh, Lab for Computer Science, and Robert Solo, the economist, had pulled together, also had tackled questions relating to the uh, uh, American uh, industrial system. So um, there was this uh, a, a very uh, diverse, disciplinarily diverse group of faculty that met every two weeks on this project for three years. But I would say that, uh, in fact, political scientists played a very special role in this group. And there was a smaller group, the group we called the backbone group, uh, that met uh, once a week to talk about these, uh, to, to really shape, design the research. And in that group, there was Rick Locke and Michael Piori, Ed Steinfeld, and a brilliant group of our graduate student RAs. And I'd like to talk a little about why I think political science and political scientists ended up playing so large a role in that project. And I think it's because political science as a discipline is riveted on the question of how government shapes the context within which individuals and individual firms operate and cooperate. It's government that shapes the resources available to individuals and to groups. And shaping context actually comes in many ways to shape outcomes. It's government that sets the rules in the market that allows, that sets the terms of cooperation and competition in the market. And as we came to understand it through our research, the context within which manufacturing continues to flourish in high wage countries like Germany and Sweden is a context in which the industrial ecosystem provides public goods and semi-public goods that individual firms can combine with their own strengths and legacies. And here I think that uh, the legacy of the work of many of us in, in comparative politics came into play because as the economists uh, argued that it was only natural uh, for manufacturing to decline just as agricultural production had, uh, those of us who had you know, worked in comparative politics inevitably started thinking of countries like Germany and Sweden in which in, in Germany 20% uh, of the workforce still works in manufacturing. Their wages and social benefits are, are, are twice those of, of American wages. So this question of what would be normal in an advanced industrial society was one that we political scientists were able to put on the, the agenda in a way that sort of disrupted the sense of normality that our economist colleagues and our engineering colleagues had, had brought to the table. So, uh, if we could see that in uh, high-wage countries like Germany and Sweden that uh, it was public policies that had played a critical role in building and sustaining the goods that created and sustained a rich industrial ecosystem, we had to ask what was it in the United States, what was it about U.S. public policies that had allowed the industrial ecosystem to dry up and essentially be hollowed out. 
what we could see in Germany was that when a, uh, uh, when a company, when a mid-sized company uh, decided that they'd like to broaden the range of products that they were making, uh, that they, they could draw uh, many resources in the ecosystem to help them make that, bring that new product, bring their new uh, ideas into a life in the market. So, uh, for example, a machine tool maker that we visited in Germany told us that he'd always made machine tools for the auto industry and realized maybe in the future that it would be safer to s diversify his activities. And so he um, came to think that maybe making machine tools for uh, uh, prosthetic devices for new hips and knees and things might be a good idea. And so what did he do? He went to, uh, there was a local technical university where he got some help. He uh, went to a Fraunhofer Institute. There were research consortia that the government had funded. And so he took his existing strengths and he combined them with resources that he was able to find very nearby in order to make this sort of shift. When we trudged across Ohio in our research group, looking at companies and trying to understand what they were doing in order to bring their new ideas to, uh, uh, to market, what we found was that in the American ecosystem, each firm has uh, the resources that it has in its own pockets. There really is nothing they could draw on in the ecosystem, or virtually nothing. We have no more local banks. We don't have anything that look like research consortia, no Fraunhofer Institutes, community colleges really very poorly connected uh, to, the, to the companies in, in, in their area. So as I came to think about uh, how to characterize the American industrial ecosystem, I thought if I could have called this study whatever I liked, I would have called it home alone. Basically, if you're an American company, you get to work with what you have in your pocket. And uh, that means that when people have great ideas, somebody who'd want to move from supplier to uh, auto industry to something like medical devices, you're going to be dripping in resources slowly, slowly, slowly as uh, from retained, from what you retain from your own profits uh, the year before. So um, I, I would say that these insights about ecosystem, the ability and, and, dis, and, and uh, the intuition that there was much to learn from other countries, uh, uh, like our own advanced industrial economies, and even much to learn from, from a country like China as they scale up their abilities, these were insights that political scientists in this group were able to contribute. And so while our engineering colleagues played a very critical role in the project by identifying the advanced technologies that were changing the game, I would say we as political scientists were able to identify the conditions under which such new technologies could be brought to life here in the United States with benefit for, for our citizens. So as we look over the results of the project, it's, it's, of course, very hard to measure exactly what our impact was, um, but as contrasted with many other things that were happening at the same time. But I do believe that our findings uh, played a really significant role in the Obama administration's decision to create the Manufacturing Innovation Institutes, the decision to create across the country uh, uh, resources that would allow companies to work together, uh, together with universities, together uh, uh, um, these manufacturing innovation institutes like the first of them, the 3D printing uh, activity uh, that was located in Youngstown, Ohio, the new photonics uh, uh, institute uh, that will bring together actually MIT with uh, manufacturers in, in uh, upper New York State. Uh, that these are institutions that really start from the idea that what we need to do is create an ecosystem where firms can find some resources that they join with their own. And I think that uh, as we did a lot of presenting and testimony to Congress about our findings in meetings with NIST and OSDP and National Academies of Science, and two of us from the Pi Group uh, were able to meet with President Obama as well uh, to talk about how we saw 
uh, uh, what ought to happen in the United States with respect to, uh, with respect to production capabilities. We published two books. And I think uh, over the long haul, while I feel uh, proud of the role that we played in this project, I think my own personal deepest uh, satisfaction is to watch those graduate students who were with us on the field research in, uh, in Ohio, in Massachusetts. Uh, those graduate students have now all gone on and have uh, jobs in leading universities <laughs> around, around the country. And I think I realize that uh, it's activities like this, the kind of ethos at, at MIT of involving graduate students in our research, of involving in them in these di interdisciplinary projects that really shapes a different kind of political scientist than these students might have been if they went to other outstanding departments. So knowing that we have trained another generation of students to, uh, to do this, for me, this is the greatest uh, kind of satisfaction at the end of it. Thank you. Thank you.